I want to talk about the day of the Lord. So in this study, we will look at the beginning of the day of the Lord. And we'll be looking at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says so much about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back at the second advent that a man could get up and quote verses about it for an entire message. No need for illustrations or stories. The Bible is so plain and to the point about what will happen at the Lord's return. Many people refuse to say anything about Jesus Christ coming back as king. You don't hear very many messages on it. And you really don't hear many messages on it when you see how much stuff about it is in the Bible. It's, it's crazy how people don't have messages on the second coming when you see it in the Bible more than any other topic. And it's almost like what they said about David in 2 Samuel 19.10. It says, And Absalom, whom we have anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? Why don't many men talk about bringing the king back? So, in this study, I want to talk about Jesus Christ coming back at the second advent. First, we see it is a day of bloodshed. Revelation 14.20 says, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Isaiah 63.1-6 through 6 says, Who is this that cometh from Edom, with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save? Look at this, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? It's a day of bloodshed, and thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fed, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will trod down trod them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed is come, and I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me, and I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Habakkuk 3.12, Thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. When Jesus Christ comes back, he will thresh the God-haters. A threshing machine or thresher is a piece of farm equipment that threshes grain. That is, it removes the seeds from the stalks and husks. It does so by beating the plant to make the seeds fall out. And Jesus Christ and his army will basically be mowing down the enemy as he comes back through with a sharp two-edged sword. The Lord coming back at the advent can be illustrated by mowing your lawn. 1 Peter 1.24 says, For all flesh is as grass. So remember the next time you are mowing your yard, you are picturing Jesus Christ as you sit on your lawnmower or tractor while the grass pictures the people that's being cut. It is a day of bloodshed. People are obsessed with blood. They love to watch gory horror movies. They love to watch fights with a lot of cuts and bloodshed. This is what they get at the second advent. They get blood. The people yelled, crucify him, back when he came the first time. But they won't crucify him again. They had Jesus shed his blood on a tree. People also love to get drunk, and they claim that Jesus got drunk. The country singers will say, if I could have a beer with Jesus. Or they say, I heard Jesus, he drank wine. So I bet we would get along just fine. And all their blasphemous songs. They love blood and they love booze. So the great whore in Revelation 17, 6 is drunken with the blood of the saints. But at the second advent, Jesus Christ gets drunk on the enemy's blood. Jeremiah 46, 10 says, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be made satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. The world wants Jesus Christ drunk, so he comes back. Like it's described in Psalm 78, 65, it says, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. They wanted him drunk so much, so he comes back like a drunken man that's violent. 
Revelation 19.13 says, And was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Psalms 58.10, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Isaiah 34.3, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. They go hide in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, but they still get trampled under feet. Isaiah 9, 5 says, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And this verse brings us to our next point. It's not just a day of bloodshed, it's a day of burning. Isaiah 30, 27 says, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. The Lord Jesus Christ basically has a flamethrower coming out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. It's going to burn every God-hater in sight. Just as Jeremiah describes the Word of God as a burning, 2 Thessalonians talks about Jesus Christ coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. This fire turns into a literal lake of fire on earth in the land of Edomia. Isaiah 34, 9 says, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Isaiah 66, 16 says, For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. We come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the army in Joel chapter 2. Even if the pre-rib or pre-wrath, post-trib guys say that Joel chapter 2 is the locus of Revelation chapter 9. By reading the context, you can obviously see Joel chapter 2 is talking about the Lord's army, the all saints. Jude says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And that's described in Joel 2. 5 and 6 says, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. So it's a day of blackness. Hebrews 12, 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. He's not destroying with water this time. This time it is fire, because God is a consuming fire. Zephaniah 1.18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Not only this, but it is also a day of bells ringing. It's a day of bloodshed. It's a day of burning. It's a day of blackness. It's a day of bells ringing. Zechariah 14.20 says, In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. The devil's counterfeit for this is Santa and his reindeer. Santa has jingle, bell, jingle bells. Jesus has bells on the horses that read holiness unto the Lord. Every year people look for Santa Claus to come back, but God the Father is thinking about his son coming back. He's not focusing on Jesus dying on the cross. He's focusing on the second advent when Jesus Christ to come, comes back and takes what's rightfully his. And he's coming back to give every man according to his works. Santa Claus is making a list and checking it twice. Jesus has the book of life. And if your name isn't on it, you get tossed into the lake of fire. But we are coming back on white horses. Jesus Christ isn't the white horse rider of Revelation chapter 6. He is the white horse rider of Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 14 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us coming back with Jesus Christ. These are supernatural horses. Could be like the horses of fire that took Elijah up in 2 Kings. And Jude 1.14 says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Revelation 19.15.16 And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God.
And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Not only is it a day of bloodshed, a day of burning, a day of blackness, a day of bells ringing. It's also a day of birds gathering. Revelation 19.21 says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth. Out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Matthew twenty four twenty eight says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The post trib pre wrath guys think the eagles are the angels, and that the body of Christ is the carcasses. But if you read Revelation nineteen, seventeen and eighteen, you obviously see that literal birds are gonna be feeding on the dead bodies. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sat on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. All the God-haters are going to be anything but bird food. Isaiah 31, 5 says the Lord will defend Jerusalem as birds flying. It's a day of birds gathering. It's a day of bloodshed, a day of burning, a day of blindness. That's our next point. It's a day of blindness. Zechariah 12, 4 says, In that day, said the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment in his rider with madness and i will open mine eyes upon the house of judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness getting struck blind is a judgment of god on sin samson was struck blind the sodomites in genesis were struck blind the nation of israel is blind in part for rejecting the messiah ephesians 4 18 shows how that a lost person is blind in heart john 12 40 shows the lost man can't believe because satan has blinded his eyes second corinthians 4 4 shows how the lost world is blind to the gospel and the more a man rejects the word of god the more blind he becomes to the word of god the enemies of god at the second coming will get their horses struck with blindness luke 6 39 says and he spake a parable unto them can the blind lead the blind Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The horses will be going into ditches and off the side of cliffs and off into the lake of fire, which will be opened up on earth. They aren't going to be able to see with the smoke coming up out of hell. Zephaniah 1.14 and 15 says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men, shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high tower, and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men. Notice that, that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. I bet that's not in the new versions. It's a day of bloodshed. It's a day of burning, a day of birds gathering, a day of blindness, a day of blackness. And next we see it is also a day of blistered hinder parts. Psalm 7866 76, says, And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. The phrase, I'm going to kick your bleep, comes from this verse. Jesus Christ is literally going to smite them in their hinder parts. When they are hiding in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, they will be anxious about their whipping that they are about to receive. This is pictured every day when a school kid is waiting for a paddling outside of the principal's office. Except Jesus won't have a paddle, but rather a sharp two-edged sword that proceedeth out of his mouth. Imagine the horror of waiting for Jesus Christ to come kill you. He won't just spank them, but he will literally smite them in their hinder parts probably dislocating it from their body. Men love violence, and in Genesis, God brought the flood because the earth was filled with violence. Men love to watch boxing matches and UFC fights and action movies, so God gives them what they want, except they will be on the receiving end of the violence. So it's a day of bloodshed, a day of burning, a day of bird gathering, a day of blindness, a day of blistered hindered parts, a day of blackness, but it's also a day of bruising the serpent. Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 
the battle wasn't over at Calvary. Satan has already lost in a sense, but he's yet to be dealt with completely according to Romans 16.20. It says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, showing it hasn't completely been fulfilled yet. And the Bible, the good guys win in the end. Only thing is, the good guys will look like the bad guys. The Bible says, Jesus Christ comes back as a thief in the night in 2 Peter 3.10. Matthew 24.42 says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. This isn't talking about the rapture, as many think. It's talking about the second coming. They don't know what hour he's coming back. That's why he comes as a thief. Joel chapter 2 says, The Lord's army will climb in the windows as a thief. And that isn't the locusts of Revelation chapter 9. That is the Lord's army. It is tens of thousands of his saints on white horses. The Antichrist and false prophet will be tossed into the lake of fire and the devil will be chained in the bottomless pit. So it's not only a day of bruising the serpent, it's a day of binding the devil. Revelation 20, 1 through 3 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Satan got himself in a bind. He gets out of the bottomless pit and deceives again with the, when the one thousand years are over. But Jesus Christ kills him so quickly that the battle only gets one verse in the book of Revelation. It says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. If you want to be on the winning side when the Lord Jesus comes back, on a day of bloodshed, a day of darkness and desolation, a day of clouds and thick darkness, then you need to believe the gospel. And the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So the gospel is this, Jesus died, he died for you, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. So Jesus died, how did he die? Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ died by shedding his blood. He took your sins, took the sins of the whole world, and died for all of those sins. Jesus Christ had to die because you're a sinner. You need a savior because you're a sinner. The consequences of not believing the gospel is that you're going to wind up in hell. You're going to wind up in a lake of fire. So you need to believe the gospel. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you realize you're a sinner, you realize you're going to hell, then come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner you are and believe on him. There's no other way into heaven. We can't be saved by being a good person. We can't be saved by being baptized. We can't be saved by going to church. We can't be saved by giving to the poor. Jesus Christ is the only righteous man that ever lived. Your unrighteousness, your righteousness are as filthy rags in the sight of God. So if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God gives you Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness. He imputes Jesus Christ's righteousness to your record and takes away your sinful record so when god sees you he will see the righteousness of jesus christ and won't see your sinful record anymore but if you want to be saved come to jesus christ as a guilty sinner and believe the gospel